Do you want to check out IT Pro TV but aren't ready to commit? We're making a few episodes from our most popular courses free for you to try here on YouTube so you can see what they're all about. Enjoy this episode and head over to itpro.tv when you're ready to see the full course. Yes, that's right. The OSI model is an important model, but there is another. Find out next. You're watching IT Pro TV. Networking is so great that it can't just do with one model. We have to have at least two. And so we are going to dive into the realm of what we call TCP IP. Now, Wes, when we start talking about this, this is where it really got confusing. Once you had learned about the OSI model, and then you say, hey, there's another model that we're also going to be following. People are like, what? why? So, Wes, help us out here. What's going on? Absolutely. And I love it how you said there's, there's not one, there's another. And it, man, that Star Wars reference. That person was our only hope. And Yoda says, no, there, there is another, right? So we're going to talk about The dark about side. That. The dark side. That's <laughs> right. Absolutely. There is another. So what, do we want, what we want to uh, really define here inside of this episode is, like Warani said, you know, the what and the why. Why do we have two models? Why are we learning two models? And what it really comes down to uh, is the fact that the networks that we are connected to today in the earlier days actually established a networking communication back when there was really five entries connected to a major network. It's back in the earlier days when we had what was known as ARPANET, all right? Advanced Research Project Agency. You have to remember that in those early days, the government made this network and universities were connecting to it and they really set the stage for what would later become what we know is really the worldwide not not web that's a specific set of protocols but really the worldwide global internet all right so this model that we're going to talk about actually predates the first uh, model that we've talked about the OSI model yeah let's talk about that just briefly here mm -hmm. because i know a little bit about the history like, like you mentioned, the very fact is at the very beginning in terms of ARPA, it was really research and, of course, government and military stuff that would go on there. That was a non-commercial venture of the Internet, right? They were sharing stuff. They were actually communicating. They were developing these different protocols. But the OSI model, it actually really developed based off of economics, right? The idea that this would become a commercial venture at some point in time. And they wanted to establish that later approach, that idea of what we were talking about, but Wes, if that's true, and we're talking about the OSI model, why are we learning about the TCP IP model now? You know, because I like how you put it, Ronnie. You said it, it was a closed network. Only the military and those research agencies, universities, if you will, were uh, on that. But there became a time when the military said, you know what, there's more and more devices, more and more companies connecting to this network. We're going to go over and go ahead and release it for public consumption right now. It's not just willy-nilly. You still have there. There are standardization bodies out there, but they turned around and went ahead and they did their own milnet. You're right, their own military network and released the precursor, if you will, over to the public. All right, and the protocol suite, if you will, that they used was already kind of firmly established at that time. It is what governs, and, and let me kind of show you, it's what governs really, it's named after two of the most important protocols. It's not the only protocols within this suite, but transmission control protocol. And if you remember what Ronnie mentioned from OSI uh, model episode, that networking layer was the most important. Why? Because of this protocol up here, IP. All right, so it's named after two of the most imp important protocols. How do we reliably get information from the source and destination? And that's where it gets its name. But it's also considered the internet model. And in the earlier days, when it was just military, in fact, Ronnie was talking about this before we started the show, it was also called the DOD model because it was really only the Department of Defense and the universities that were contracting through our United States military. So it was developed by DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, and it's essentially a suite of protocols, right? And like I've already mentioned, it was developed prior to the OSI model, and today it is the real, really the de facto standard when it comes to communications across the public internet. Yeah, this is the key that most people end up forgetting. It's like there's two models, but we're teaching the OSI model, but we're following the TCP IP model. And the reason why we're doing that is because it was a commercial venture, TCPIP and, of course, the OSI model, they were competing standards. 
But the issue was fairly simple. TCP IP was already mature. It was already established on the internet at that point. So when it came down to full adoption and de facto standards like what Wes is talking about, and that's actually a good term for you to define here in a moment uh, as well, is that, hey, it's already working. Why are we now taking a look at the new model? Well, that's when that OSI model kind of got pushed aside a little bit. It's great in terms of teaching so that we understand how networking works, but the true implementation is TCP IP. So Wes, let's go back to this idea Let's talk about the idea of de facto. What do you mean by that? That's absolutely great. You know, it's been so long since I've thought about it, I just use that term and don't think about defining it. De facto essentially means a standard that's widely adopted by many organizations. And you can think of that as being the OSI model, right? We talked about those organizations that got together and tried to standardize in communications. When we talk about internet communications, however, that's more of what's called a de jour. All right, and I always love to say de jure. I've heard people say mm -hmm. it's a French word, right? And that means... Uh, more, it, it is more governed by a law or a rule, if you will, not just a publicly accepted uh, like de facto is. So understand that this became the structured implementation, all right, not just a recommendation, if you will, on how we govern or we uh, communicate across the public internet today. So let's go ahead and let's dive in to what the TCP mo uh, IP model is, all right? And this is a little bit different of a layer. It's still a layered approach, so it has that similarities, and there are some similarities. But one of the things you're going to notice is there's a lot less layers, right? All right, there's four layers, all right? And we're going to do, Ronnie, I mm -hmm. think we're going to do the same thing that we did with OSI model. We're going to work from a top-down approach. Okay. Keep in mind, you can explain this. From bottom up, they even got, when you're talking about troubleshooting, dividing and conquering and starting in the middle, right? For explanation purposes, we're going to start from the top and work our way down. And the application layer, we end up having what's known as the transport layer, the internet layer, and again, layer two, if you will, and finally, the network interface layer. So starting at the top, what is the application layer? All right, well, the application layer, essentially, it provides our application network access. But it's doing a lot more than that. It's actually kind of bundling a lot of the functionality that we've seen in the OSI model and kind of squeezing it together all in this first layer. I'll show you the comparison coming up. This is where we get things like network access. This is where we get our formatting, if you will, all important, as well as things like session establishment all happening there at the application layer. Yeah, this application layer really is kind of the key as far as, once again, still preparing the data for the network. So that's actually going to be important, uh, but it's not that they've gotten rid of all those other things, but they've just said, look, the application handles all of that. We're not going to worry about the way that we actually break that down. Uh, so they actually kind of grouped it all in that one layer. Definitely. So that moves us, Ronnie, down to the next layer in the stack. And the next layer in the stack you're going to see is layer three for us, all right? And that's the transport layer. Now, why are we talking about the numbers as well? Because it's going to be important, and I want you to remember on the exam, you have to pay attention to the context of the question. You have to know what the question is asking you, because layer three for the OSI model is different than layer three for the traditional TCP IP model. So if we strip all the other layers back and we focus in on that transport layer, what are we looking at? All right. A lot of the same functionality that we see in the OSI model, right? Providing that end-to-end -end data integrity and reliable communication, right? This is where we're going to make the decision of what transport protocol we use. And just as a real quick recap, remember transmission control protocol, we have that connection-oriented, reliable delivery. UDP, all right, not as complex as TCP, but it doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles, right? UDP says, hey, I'm going to throw it in the mail and I hope it gets there. And that has its place in the world. You might say, well, wait a second. Why don't I want to ensure that the data is maintaining its integrity? Well, with traditional protocols that are like file transfers, right, we want to make sure that that information is received in the right order because we want that data to stay, uh, uh, maintain its integrity. But when we have things like streaming media where we don't need things to be rebuilt, in fact, if we waited to, for it to be rebuilt, maybe the football player would already be in the end zone, we can afford to lose a few packets. So understand that they both have their place with inside of networking communications. There isn't a right way and a better way. It's just that you do have multiple op or a couple of options if you, uh, you know, when it comes down to it with the transport layer. Yeah, the transport layer is really kind of the key differentiation here with the OSI model. And the very fact that what we're really concerned about in TCP IP is the delivery of the data. Now, don't get me wrong. They want the data, of course, to get from source to destination, but their primary boundary or their primary jumping point 
is making sure it can go from network to network to network. So that's why you see like the application stuff is kind of all crammed in there in that one block, even though it's all still happening. But they spend a lot more focus in on those lower three layers here because that's where they need to detail that they needed to expand that out a bit more. Definitely. So once we've established that, hey, we know what kind of communication uh, delivery method we need, right? Now we've got to move down a little bit, right? And the third layer is what's known as the internet layer. Now, why is it called the internet layer? Well, the internet layer is responsible if we kind of drill this, strip all the layers down, and we look at this, this is where we get back to that idea of IP addressing, routing, all right, very briefly just making a decision. I receive a packet with it in uh, this network adapter. I look at a database, and I got to make decisions on where to send it, right? And we do that through the process of finally it getting to the destination network, right? And we've shown you some examples of protocols that work here, right? The internet protocol, this is where it sits. Things like the Internet Control Message Protocol. We'll talk about what they're doing a little bit later. And finally, network address translation. So back to, again, Ronnie's earlier statement on the OSI model when he said that networking layer was the most important. Well, these are all important layers, mm -hmm. but that's pretty much where this functionality is sitting. So this is a very, very important layer when it comes to communications across the Internet today. Yeah, without the addressing, right? We really cannot send it from a source to destination so it's important that this was established as the main or the the uh, the only protocol itself that would end up really working across the internet, and that's the reason why we consider it probably the most important when it comes down to network delivery. All right, Ronnie, ready for a little bit of confusion? Sure. You know, now that we've got a little bit of a compound of understanding, I'm going to throw a rock in it, and that's this last one. The last one is layer one, and again, pay attention to the context of any question you have on the Network Plus exam as to what model they might be referring to. All right, again, if we strip off all the other layers and we just look at the network interface layer, now what we're talking about is defining things like the electrical characteristics, right? We're defining what is the media access method, all right? How is that information transmitted across the wire, right? And again, so you can kind of see some squishing here of that, what we would see in the OSI model, right? Now we have all of that functionality built into those lower layers, giving you some examples of Ethernet, We'll talk about the IEEE's 802 standard a little bit later. This is where wireless communications, things like fiber versus copper, all come into play. Yeah, now, once we actually get this, Wes, I kind of realized something that we had said earlier when we talked about de facto and de jure mm -hmm. here. So remind me again, because I think I got it backward. TCP IP, you say, is the de jure standard, or is it the de facto standard? It's the de jure standard, okay. because it's... it's it, it, there is no... Um, well, if you accept it. De facto is, hey, it's just... Uh, kind of like widely accepted by organizations, and that's where I would say the OSI okay. model is more of the de facto standard, where if you're going to be uh, communicating across the Internet, you're required to use it and uh, communicate this way. Yeah, no, I think I said it backward. That's why I want to make sure we got that clear. All right, now, Wes, once we have these four layers, though, we've kind of realized something over time that they've even made a little bit more of a mess out of this. So how did that happen? They they definitely did. So one of the things that you'll notice is that we've got a lot of squish, squished layers here. All right, there's a little bit more flexibility in the TCP IP model, but one of the things that they were noticing is that they needed to further define, especially the lower portions of this stack. So we now have a new TCP IP model, and I'm not sure which one they might ask you on the exam, so we want to set you off on the right foot, especially as this is more of your foundational information that hopefully is going to lead to a very successful career in networking, and as you go up that uh, success ladder, uh, you're going to see that it comes up uh, definitely in uh, training as well. And what they did here is focusing down on that network interface layer. What they said is, hey, you know what we got to do here? What we really got to do is we got to take and we got to define that by breaking it up a little bit more. And that's essentially what they've done. It's a five layer model, right? Uh, and your layer two and your layer one there are the data link layer and the physical layer. And that actually should help out a little bit more if you've already kind of got the OSI model, if you're following along with us sequentially, because you can see that now it defines and breaks up the functionalities. We've got the application, the transport, the internet layer, then we have that data link layer and the physical layer. And now you can see, rather than grouping all that functionality I did together, like in the traditional model, now we've actually got that defining line there, if you will, between these two layers. So this is really just a separation of the functionality and formally defining it in two layers rather than one. Yeah, this was important because the way that that original network interface layer ended up happening, right, they took function and then they said, hey, that actually all is all grouped to the physical 
uh, a component itself when at times it could have been a logical component. So this is a good separation, but because of the way exams are, we never know which one they're going to ask you about, so you need to know them both. Definitely. So, Ronnie, what I we've kind of done this as uh, you and I have gone through the TCP/IP model, but let's go put put a little bit more formality sure. to it. Maybe something that you can see a little bit more visually. So, what I've got here is a side by side comparison of our seven layer OSI model that we've already discussed, as well as how it applies to our TCP/IP model. And if you look, you can see that the application functioning block of the OSI model, I always remembered it because it's spelled out, APS, apps, right? Well, that's actually separated in OSI model. However, I want you to remember that all three of those layers functionalities are sandwiched together, if you will, in the application layer of the uh, TCP IP model. Now, it's easy for the transport. <laughs> Transport's a one-to-one. -one. The network layer and the internet layer, if you will, are a one-to-one -one comparison. Now, if you're using the traditional TCP IP model, remember the sandwiching of that layer one there, uh, that functionality is all built into that lower network interface layer. If you use the five layer model, a lot of the things still apply. The application presentation and session all sandwiched together in TCP IP's layer five, not called layer four in the five layer model, right? Transports on one-to-one -one mapping, network uh, layer, internet layer, one-to-one -one mapping. And now what you have is a little bit easier of an understanding because now the data link layer actually maps to the data link layer on the TCP IP model, and so does the physical layer as well. So that's kind of the comparison. If you would have to compare it, um, a little bit exam alert. Pay attention to the context of the model that they're talking about because layer uh, one in the traditional model and layer one uh, in the OSI model are the same, all right? When you say the new model, layer one and layer two, the data link layer on the uh, TCP IP model, they're not a one-to-one -one mapping anymore. They're now formally broke up. So that's why we brought both models in so you'll be a little bit more prepared when you sit that NetPlus exam. Well, Wes, before we kind of wrap everything up here, mm -hmm. okay, so let's talk about why we actually are still teaching the OSI model, even though that's not the one that's really used on the internet. Uh, why are we still teaching that when we could just be focusing in on TCP IP? Well, because, um, again, it's more of that standardization. And when it comes down to it, you know, um, I think about the troubleshooting aspect of things, being able to um, precisely identify where the maybe the communication breakdown is, if you will. Uh, and that's one of the ways that I see it. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is, I think you mentioned it, I think it was earlier in this episode, if not in a previous episode here, is that it is now considered a reference model, mm -hmm. even though it's not being used. It is good to learn it because that's how we still treat the way that data actually moves across the network. Functionally, and the way that actually works is TCP IP, but in terms of teaching and understanding, you'll still hear people using the OSI model. So that's why we want to make sure we have that clarification. All right, any last words, Wes, as we kind of uh, wrap up this episode? No, just be able to map the layers to their names, and I would memorize them forwards and backwards, and be able to summarize some of the functionalities in each of those layers so that you'll be doing well. Again, if you're put into a situation and a scenario where you need to define that functionality and not necessarily just um, you know repeat a definition, it's going to help when you actually need to apply the information that we're teaching you here. All right. Well, you heard it right from Wes. There are plenty of, there are plenty of models for you to take a look at and make sure you understand how to match up. But how does it actually end up working? Well, the way that you find that out of, uh, you, of course, is going to be continuing on with us in our Network Plus show. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.